Thanks for joining us. Um, as we do normally, I'm going to welcome Freda, Hawk, and uh, Bob, and our very special guest. I'm going to back out. You guys have a great time. I'm here to support you if you need me. Bye. Again. Hi, everybody. Um, I just want to mention that today is Hawk's 35th show of both Inside Hollywood and Behind the Book. So thank you, Hawk. You're extraordinary. We love you. This is a wonderful way to um, do our 35th milestone. We're thinking of extending your, Hawk, we're thinking of extending your contract. We'll be talking to your agent uh, later today, depending on how this show goes, actually. Can I move that's it up to 50 That's a cents? joke, Bob. I mean, you're making sort of light of, of something like that, because, I mean, I... I Take everything literally. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, this gentleman who you see right here, Elliot Gould, is only a Broadway song and dance man, an Oscar nominee, an actor in over 75 films, a six-time Saturday Night Live host. Too many television shows to mention, but includes both Friends and Ray Donovan. He's a producer a sports nut, a deep, deep thinker, and a man loved by so many, including me. Welcome, Elliot Gould. Thank you, uh, Hawk. Uh, I, uh, I, this is so much fun. So those of you who know, I wrote a book, uh, I guess, pre-COVID, and Elliot was nice enough to interview me at SAG when it came out. So now... He didn't write a book, but I've got a few of his stories that we're going to talk about. Um, and there is no way in an hour and a half to cover even a small portion of the seven-decade career. But I do want to start by asking about your early life. Now, I know you were raised in Brooklyn. Your mom sold uh, artificial flowers to beauty shops, and your dad was in the garment industry. So why did they put you in a, like a professional school at a young age? Well, I didn't think of the flowers that my mother sold as being artificial. Uh, oh. But uh, I, I understand your interpretation of that. Uh, <laughs> they, I was uh, brought to a neighborhood song and dance school uh, when I was about eight or eight and a half. Uh, being that uh, I uh, was a very shy and uh, inhibited and repressed, and there are others like me, and uh, I had no idea what to do. And being that the kindergarten teacher at PS 247 when I was six told my mother, Lucille, and I uh, that I seemed to have a little bit of extra intelligence uh, than the other people in the class uh, because I was the only child who knew that I didn't know the difference between my right and my left side. So I was brought to song and dance school and my thought, because I mean, I've been thinking since my inception, which was probably around Thanksgiving of 1937, uh, 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 and, and so I thought, gee, I, I mean, this is not what I had in mind. And uh, but if I, I'm taught routines and I can memorize a routine and I could feel secure in knowing what I'm supposed to say, perhaps I can communicate through which uh, uh, I have already learned. I mean, I, I don't have a script. Life does not have a script. Uh, and so did I answer your question? Yeah, I, th I think you did. So when you got to this school and you were learning song and dance, when you came home, had, had your shyness gone away or? No, 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 no. Like uh, Ingmar Bergman said, no, no, little brother, you said. Uh, 
no, I mean, we're all sensitive and our sensitivity sometimes gets beaten out of us and sensitivity like we're, this is what we are, you know, so no, it's taken me forever. The two things besides my mother who bore me that saved my life was a movie camera and philosophy. And on the third film in which I participated, which we worked on uh, together, a Hawk, uh, that was Paul Mazursky's first directorial uh, uh, assignment, uh, Bob and right. John, Ted and Alice, uh, I realized that uh, the camera didn't give me problems. I gave me problems. Yeah. The camera didn't lie to me, didn't promote me, and didn't manipulate me. It just reported what I did, which is my only objective relationship in existence. It really helped to save my being. And as so, far as what? So, so when, so now you're doing song and dance, you're in school. Did your parents take you to theater or did you go yes. to the movies? There was no, there was no TV. There was radio. I, I loved the radio. The radio. I, know. radio. I, I was there. I came over by covered wagon, so I'm a little ahead of you, but go ahead. That's what you think. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, they uh, they Movies or theater? Movies and theater. But uh, also, we lived at 6801 Bay Parkway in Brooklyn for New York, and we didn't have uh, any, any money. But uh, my parents took me to musical theater in on broadway i saw the first production of guys and dolls i saw where's charlie and i saw a review uh, which uh, was a, a show without a book which, uh, with uh, paul and grace hartman called all for love and uh, as far as the movies on saturday nights they would take me to the movies around the corner the marlboro theater and uh, I was very much, I couldn't handle scary movies. I mean, like uh, The Spiral Staircase, I still get a shudder. I've talked with Alfred Hitchcock about the power of suggestion, but I saw For Whom the Bell Tolls, and I saw Moulin Rouge, and, uh, and this was pre-television. So, I mean, my parents uh, did a very good job with me. And did they get, did that get you excited like wow that's what i want to do no i remember i'm i mean i'm shy and i i don't uh understand donald sutherland who's what my best mate uh he uh he said to me what good does it do to know everything when you don't understand anything now that i'm understanding i can't say that i don't know anything and so as to finish a previous thought in relation to what saved my life philosophy the greek definition of philosophy is for the love of knowledge and we have some curiosity i find to be the best i find that the directors and actors and writers that i've worked with through the years the ones who were the best were the most curious did you find that no no that's too general uh that's way too general I mean, curiosity is great. I know that uh, my my dear friend, uh, uh, the inimitable uh, uh, John Huston, the last thing he said to us before he passed was, "Stay interested." Stay. I, I've always had a problem with uh, tyranny, and uh, and that. So sometimes I've been I've been difficult, uh, but that's only because it's been difficult for me. I'm not. I mean, I I, I love us i love uh, everybody involved in the process and as a unionist i believe that no one of us can be any more than the least of us but then again this is a business and that's where i had some problems in terms of the business mentality and the business set of values and the politics that go into that so i'm very uh, what? We'll, we'll try and stay away from that stuff. And oh, I want to go into it. it. I can learn. I learned through you. Are you kidding? I, I, well, I learned from us. Oh, yeah. I, I want to know. Good. So no. so you went to this professional school, and then how did, because I know at 19, you started getting small parts in Broadway musicals. Had you, 
had had no 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 more no, teachers? No, 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 no. Let's let 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 let's really. I mean, I mean, you haven't ever had me here before, uh, and no. uh, and I I believe uh, uh, that I still have some friends who are living uh, at the home. And I hope Michael Callen is still there. He is. Oh, that's great. He was he was great. Oh my God, I I watched him work. I mean, he was so so talented and so attractive. And uh, Mark Rydell, I believe, is there. And Ted Witzer, I believe, is there. And I should know more people. And I intend to come out. Uh, yeah. Well, I, when when COVID is over, over. I'm going to bring you out, and we'll have lunch with all those people. Uh, well, uh, I'll, I, I accept. Thank you. So tell me, tell me what I said wrong about you getting small parts in musicals. No, 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 no. That by the first uh, Broadway uh, uh, musical I got, I got into was called Rumple, and I was I uh, turned eighteen. And oh, sorry, eighteen. Yeah, yeah, come on with you. I mean, precision is in business, precision is essential, you know, and especially since this is all family here. I mean, what we're looking at in terms of criminal intent, where there is criminal intent in business, that's what fucks me up, you know, me, because I mean, I love us. And 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 just recently, the elder canine in my family, Mabel. Uh, was 15 and a half and we had to put her down and I wept oh. for days. I'm sorry. And I realized to care, to love, oh, it's so beautiful. So beautiful to care, to love and to care. And that's what we're doing here. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of being precise, in uh, May of 1951, yeah. I was 12 years old and I played the palace. Uh, and it was the first anniversary of the return of vaudeville to the palace, and I was in somebody's act. Uh, and the act that I was in, and the guy who chose me to be uh, like uh, a messenger boy uh, in the act, and I followed Smith and Dale. Uh, Smith and Dale were the original Sunshine Boys. The Sunshine Boys were based on Charlie Smith, uh, Joe Smith, and Charlie Dale, and and so I had to be in the back of the house of the palace. And when they went a blackout, I had to count to three, and then start to deliver a, a telegram to Bill Callahan and go all the way down to the conductor. And the conductor says to me, in the, who's there with the orchestra in the pit and the entire audience at the Palace uh, uh, Theater, he said, what are, you, what are you doing? I said, I have a telegram for Bill Callahan. And, and now I, I'm 12 years old. And, uh, and he said, I'll take it. And I said, no, no, I have to give it to him. And then the music starts and I go on stage and I'm on the stage right. Uh, and I don't know right. From, I still don't know right. Right from left. I mean, when I look at the stage, I'm, I'm outside. Uh, and Bill Callahan. I, so I say, telegram for Callahan, paging Callahan. And then there's a scrim with a silhouette, and you see this guy, very, very masculine, uh, and you can't see because he's a shadow un until I leave. And uh, he says, uh, I'm dancing and I can't be bothered now. And he does something and I have to do it three times. Uh, and then I'm off until the next show. We have four shows a day with a movie in between. Uh, and I have the, hot, the, the, the last dressing room in the highest place where there's life like us uh, at the palace. I'm 12 years old. After that, and that was the, they, they sent me uh, to the professional children's school. And I did you I, love it, Elliot? Did you love doing that four times a day? What a privilege. Uh, Howie, oh, forgive me. Occasionally I, I make my mistakes. Uh, All right. No, no, this is very deep, uh, uh, Hawk. I know I, you gave me a, 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 a not Mr. Koch, certainly <laughs> not. Let me see. How many Howies do I know? Howie. Howie Paulette used to be, would be a, a baseball pitcher. I love baseball. So that year, 1951, that was uh, that was one of the worst years of my life because uh, that's when Bobby Thompson hit the shot heard around the world. Ralph Branco pitched Probably. through the pitch. I, I think about making a movie sometime where that's going on and somebody's listening to it. And... Uh, uh, and and Chuck Dressen, who was the manager of the Dodgers, 
throws the book away and, and puts the winning run on base, which was uh, Bobby Thompson and Willie Mays. And I, I lie. I say that Willie Mays told me, but I think he's still living. So I, I, perhaps I can get him to tell me he wouldn't mind that we can we put him in a movie. And uh, to say that uh, uh, if, if Chuck if if Chuck Dresson throws the book away and puts the winning run on base, uh, I'm hitting into a double play because I'm, uh, uh, to end the game and the Dodgers win the pennant because at, at heart and it, down deep I'm a Dodger fan. <laughs> Amazing. So Elliot, so you do all of this. So my question was, did you love it? And you said. No, I'm telling you, this is just the, the result of that. Did I love it? Wow. Um, wow. I believe when I when I asked to meet, and this is this is what you got. This is why you're paying me the big bucks. And I, I'm sure there are some people in there who say this guy's crazy. I ain't crazy, believe me. Um, uh, that when I asked to meet John Wooden the great John Wooden, the Wizard of Westwood. Um, and, and we arranged a meeting, just the two of us. And I was waiting for him uh, at a place called Vips uh, in Tarzana near where he lived. And uh, he came up to me and he said, told me that he had been an English teacher in uh, uh, Indiana where he came from and that the most important word in the dictionary is love and the second most important word and i thought what there's another word besides love all i was look or ever looked for was love of course we needed money but how do you make money you know but uh we we learn or some of us make a big fool that's how i feel about celebrity that some of us have to make a bigger fool of ourselves than others you know talk about actors go ahead uh, what was the second actor. word Oh, th that's good, uh, Hawk. Um, um, let, let me let, let me let me bring it up. Uh, the second word is I Don wouldn't think about it. I've, I've never let me know later. No, don't wait. Just keep on going because this comes around. When people oh, ask me okay. how's it going, I say it, uh, around. It's going around. Yeah. So, so let's skip because we got so much to talk about. I want to. You you've done a bunch of stuff in your teens, and you're in your early twenties now, and you audition for a Broadway show in front of three of the greatest, I guess, Broadway people ever: David Merrick, Herb Ross, and Arthur Lawrence, and you get the role the lead role in uh, I Can Get It For You Wholesale. Tell us about that audition and what happened. Well, I, but I, I had been in several other shows and I'd worked for uh, David Merrick. I did Irma La Duce. And uh, I remember it's interesting that, I, that this one word, uh, I, I'm, uh, which th this will be a treasure uh, for uh, everyone. And I promise uh, to share that word um, balance is the word ah love and balance and balance uh also having been a, a dancer and having studied ballet there's a position in ballet called uh ladder the attitude and so for any one of us uh, who has attitude uh, that's a balance balance in relation to character in relation to that. So I, I got my first, I wanted to be, when you said three people, I very much wanted to be in West Side Story. And I mean, I had no agent. I didn't know anyone. Uh, what I listened, uh, there would be a show on Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock called Let's Pretend. And I used to listen to it all the time. Um, there was also a show on 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 television called when when television came in. I, I remember 1948 because I believe that the Cleveland Indians and the Boston Braves were involved in baseball, baseball and the Brooklyn Dodgers. That was great for me, just great. And listening to the radio, I'd far rather listen to it on the radio because I I can see what's I can I feel everything, and. Uh, 
So I, I, I didn't get into West Side Story. And I just wanted to be in a chorus or be one of the Jets or however I'd be cast. I don't know, I wouldn't know who I am or what I am, I'm just one of us. And uh, you, so when you said three people, when somebody left, I think it was Clifford Davies left the show and they just getting ready to go out of town to break West Side Story in. I was asked to come back because I, I was seemed to be close and they seemed to, I seemed to have something that they thought they could use. And I auditioned uh, down in the basement of the Winter Garden uh, for Leonard Bernstein, uh, Stephen Sondheim, wow. Arthur Lawrence, uh, uh, and Jerome Robbins. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I think I was taller than the tallest jet. And so I didn't get into it. Uh, and so I didn't get, but then I got into a show called Rumpel, which starred Eddie Foy Jr. And I remember so many people in the cast, uh, balance, balance, balance. And then I liked it when I went to the Alvin Theater, which is now known as the Neil Simon Theater. It smelled great. It was on 52nd Street. This is the Alvin Theater. I, I mean, I'd been, the, my parents took me to, a, to, I told you, I saw Guys and Dolls with uh, Alan Alda's father with Robert Alda. And so uh, I thought I, li I liked some place to belong. I liked being in the theater. And of course we were, we were a flop, but I got out of town. I'd never been out of town. I went to Boston and I went to Philadelphia. And uh, I was in the show. And uh, then uh, the, Matt Maddox, who's one of the dancers, one of the brothers in Seven Brides for Seven Brothers was one of my teachers, a great athletic uh, a dancer uh, who was a Jack Cole dancer. And he, he was uh, going to be um, choreographing a show called Say Darling. And I got into it and Abe Burroughs was the director. And it was uh, produced by Julie Stein and, and Compton and Green did the words and they, they may have done the book. It was based on uh, the pajama game, on the making of pajama game. And I was third assistant stage manager. And, uh, and that was great. And then I couldn't find any work. We ran for almost a year. So we, we want to work my way up to, uh, to I can get a few wholesale when, uh, uh, Barbara audition for me in the audience, being that they cast me in the leading role. So you were sitting, you were sitting down that, you know, that whether or not it, honestly, but it's that iconic thing of. What do you mean, you whether know? or not honestly? How dare you? I, I mean, well, I thought you said you knew me and we're friends. I have no choice. I'm, I'm honest. That's pretty great. Okay. I told, I told, Were you no, 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 the... I'm going to inter interrupt you because you ask for this. Is that when I when I met uh, Shaquille O'Neal, he's pretty big, and, and I said you're going to like this. I met him around the same time. I met Charles Barkley. I like Charles Barkley, being that uh, uh, Jimmy Brown, who's my friend, uh, said I, I'd like you to talk to uh, uh, to Charles Barkley. He's very smart, and uh, I, I'm not so smart, and. Uh, uh, and and so I said, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people will stop me. I've done so much work and there are people who think they know me or people who recognize me from things I've done. And people will walk up to me and say, are you serious? And I say, I, I, I don't have to be so serious any longer. I know I'm honest and it's taken me forever to get here. Carry on. So you're you're in the seats and up on the stage. So it's one seat. I mean, I'm in a seat behind Jerome Weidman, who had written the original book, which uh, 20th Century Fox, I think, made a movie out of with uh, uh, Dan Daly and uh, uh, Susan Hayward playing the character. Uh, right. Was so was was Merrick there? No. I don't think so. He had seen it. These are callbacks. These are the final callbacks for the people who are going to support me. And so you, you, you tell us how you interacted with Barbara when she auditioned. Well, I mean, I, I, there were other people who auditioned for different parts. And uh, she came out and did an 
unbelievable audition. I mean, unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it. I'll start to cry. And Jerome Weidman, who had written the original material and wrote the book for I Can Get It For Your Wholesale, uh, which uh, cast me in a part that was unplayable. It was an impossible part, but st still I'd never, I didn't know anything. I'm going for coming from the chorus and playing leading role on, on Broadway. And he turned to me and he said about her, she's, what do you think? He said, what do you think? I, I said, she's brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. And she presents herself just like how I think about me. She's scared to death. And she has all these little sticks, you know, I mean, to little, little tricks that she does. So she finished her audition. And then as they do in this business, they said, okay, thank you. Because then they've got to meet and decide who they're going to choose. And uh, she said, she was just standing there on the stage and they were waiting for the next person to come. And she said, would somebody call me? Here's, and she, she announced her telephone number. And uh, I, uh, I memorized it. And so uh, I, I went back after all of that uh, to the uh, Alvin, because I, let's see what theater, it may have been the Schubert, I don't know where, but I mean, the Broadway theaters are great. Last night, no, not last night. Sunday night. It was the, uh, the, uh, the Tonys, yeah, the Tony Awards. And so I, met, I called her and uh, I said, uh, I don't think I'd ever called anybody before. And I said, I thought that you were uh, absolutely brilliant and that you, uh, you have a real good chance that you deserve to have the part. And she said, I'm seeing someplace tonight, uh, come and see me. And I said, no, 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 if I'm right, uh, when, when we go and you get the part, when we're rehearsing, we'll get to know one another. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Very cool. So you didn't go that night, but you did start. She did get I the married part. Her, somebody, we had a 40th anniversary of Capricorn One. And in Capricorn One, my character saves the life of James Brolin. And he was at there with Peter Himes, who wrote it and directed it uh, uh, with me and, uh, and Brolin. And somebody in the audience said, you didn't have much screen time with uh, Jim uh, 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 about talking. I said, what are you talking about? We married the same girl. <laughs> Well, let's go to Capricorn just for a minute. We'll jump out of sequence because uh, there were so many people when Capricorn One came out said, you know what, that, I don't think that Neil Armstrong really went to the moon and see, he, they did it on a soundstage like they did on Capricorn One. Do you remember that? I, 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 when I don't remember, it took me a while to get balance, you know, but that's understandable. Everything is a metaphor to me. So you can imagine and you know what balance is, but mentally and in, in terms of how we think and how we're programmed, sure. When, when I was working for Lou Grade, Lord Lou Grade, friend of mine, the great organization, uh, I had said to him, I, I insist you put me into the Muppet movie. My children love the Muppets. And he was producing a Muppet movie. So he, he gave me a, a small part in it. And I introduced Miss Piggy. But uh, uh, with Capricorn One, uh, we, I, I was making a picture or participating in a picture in England, and I had to go to a convention of, of distributors. Or, or, or most of, again, I don't want to be uh, misinterpreted. Uh, uh, and they asked me, uh, what was Capricorn One uh, about? Because I, I think I was working for the rank organization doing a respectful, a respectable remake of one of Alfred Hitchcock's masterpieces, The Lady Vanishes, mm -hmm. and, uh, as a, and a, which gave me an opportunity to spend hours with Alfred Hitchcock. And they asked me, and we took screens that Superman uh, wasn't prepared for because uh, Dick Donner took a little longer uh, cutting the picture. So I think Warner Brothers may have uh, distributed it. And they said to me, what is Capricorn one about? And I said, what you see is not necessarily what you get. And the news that I saw today in relation to the criminal intent 
that we're trying to really get under so we can prosecute what's happened to this country and where we're at is a, somewhat of an inspiration. I saw a, uh, uh, I, I studied American history. I, all I ever wanted to do was to be American. And what I said to uh, uh, Mr. Hitchcock, I said, you're just like an American. I said, and what the American is to me is that which has evolved from everyone else as in the infant of the rest of the world. Very cool, Elliot. Oh, thanks. Now tell us about it's a little warm out there. You know, we're having a heat spell. Tell, let's 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 move to the movies. Because the first movie you do, at least that I can I know about, is a movie called Quick. Let's get married, starring yeah, it's Ginger Rogers. To begin with, first it was called The Confession. We made right. The Confession, directed by William Dieterle. William Hunchback of Notre Dame and Life of Emile Zola. One of the great old directors. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. He collaborated. One of the old directors. I'll take the word great out if that's what you uh, No, I, we could do better than old uh, Hawk. You know, a experienced, a iconic. Iconic. Okay. Yeah. I'm using iconic in another, in a, in a little while in another question. So I didn't want to use that one now. Okay. I'm so, not a wise guy, you know. Did you did you get as a song and dance man? Did you dance with Ginger Rogers in this movie? No, but afterwards I asked her to play my mother, and she said it was too ribald, it was too racy, and so we. And uh, I, I, I thought it was very innovational uh, uh, casting for her to be my mother. I spoke with her. Uh, so her. being that that's the first movie, you had been on the stage, which because I've worked with stage actors who moved to movies. Did you find, well, how was your transition moving from, you know, how oh, great out here to, to, to the camera? Uh, I didn't know anything. We shot the picture on the island of Jamaica at the same time that Dr. No was being made there and A High Wind in Jamaica, a great movie, uh, uh, I believe by, by, directed by Alexander McKendrick uh, with Anthony Quinn and a great actor. Uh, and they were all on the island we're make, and uh, we're doing this schlocky picture, Rayma Land, let's not forget Rayma Land uh, and Barbara Eden who's still with us. And uh, oh my God! Every time Cecil, she wiggles her nose, yes. Cecil Calloway was in it, and I'm oh I'm Alessandro. I'm a deaf mute, and uh, the first scene that I shot uh, is that Carl Shell, Maximilian, and Maria's brother uh, is my friend in it. I believe Colgate uh, uh, was backing the picture. Uh, uh, and uh, as I think I said, that Ginger's husband was producing it. And the first scene I'm in is that Carl Shell and I are drunk and we're rast, we're rousting Ray Milland, who is looking like everybody else is for the hidden gold, you know, the hidden gold. We are right away. We got a, a problem uh, in terms of that. So a hidden gold. Uh, and so I, my first thing, I'm acting for the first time. And I want to give the impression like I'm drunk and I'm close to him. And after a, a while, uh, the, some older man behind the camera says, cut. The sound man says, cut. And he walks over to Dieterle and points to me. And he said, he's breathing too loud. And I thought, oh, my God. I don't know how to breathe. How the, the fuck am I ever going to act? <laughs> Well, we're going to skip a couple others, but uh, you got to work with Natalie Wood, Robert Culp, Diane Cannon, and a young assistant director named Howard Koch Jr. on uh, Paul Mazursky's Bob and Carol and Ted Malice. Uh, I thought you were brilliant. Everybody else thought you were brilliant. And in fact, you were nominated for an Oscar for supporting actor from that movie. And uh, you went to the Oscars, but the year before, uh, your wife uh, won, uh, or actually tied, winning the Oscar for Funny Girl, and now you're going to the Oscars 
the next year? How did that, te- what was going on in your head at that time? And I was making what was it M- like to go to the Oscars as the nominee? I was uh, making MASH with Robert Altman. And uh, mind you, now go back a year. Uh, I, I, I try, when I, I obviously try, I trust, I, I always have trusted uh, blindly. Uh, and part of it is instinct, but it's not educated, it's natural. And so uh, when I went to the Oscars for the first time with my wife at the time, she asked me to escort her. We weren't together, but we were married. And of course, our son uh, is uh, the most decent person that I I know. That was pretty amazing. Then now the next year, uh, I went to the Oscars and they sat me next to John Wayne on the side. I think he won. I mean, I have to look at look at it. And yeah, true I, grit. What's that? True grit. Was that it? Maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm maybe. Oh no! Well, it was un- unbelievable. Um, and how did it feel? You say. Uh, embarrassing uh, to me in terms of not understanding. It's one of the reasons I'm the way I am. I'm excessive. I get feelings and and any one of us should still be able to identify with this in terms of what I am. Uh, you know, I mean, I have to be uh, one of us uh, if before I can uh, be an actor. I mean, I know what it is to be a baby I'm very close to the baby, the infant. Uh, We know one another. And so I was so gratified. I think I was making, I may have been making, because I did picture after picture after picture, uh, because I knew I would hit the wall and I wanted to learn as much as I could. Uh, and, And Jack Nicholson, was not my friend, but we're friendly, and uh, I res- respect him. He's uh, very so talented and uh, so big brain. Well, you, you had met him the year before when uh, you visited Barbara on the set of uh, On a Clear Day, I think. Thanks to your father. Yeah, he ran the studio. Oh, uh, yes, I know that. But uh, Jack Nicholson was up the same year I was up for. Uh, for an Easy Rider. And I remember going to see Easy Rider with uh, one of our directors, Stuart Rosenberg, at that time. And Stuart Rosenberg said to me, we saw it at a screening at the studio. He said, I wish I had made that picture. And I thought, gee whiz, gee whiz, I wish that uh, Bobby Thompson hadn't hit a home run off of Ralph Brank. I mean, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, Stuart, uh, you know, Stuart Rosenberg. Uh, and uh, so Jack Nicholson said to me, I'm winning, Al. You're not, you can't win. I'm winning. And I thought, yeah, I really don't think that way. And so that time, and of course, Jack Nicholson can't have any regrets, but uh, Dick Young won that year. But I, I never really understood, and I haven't asked, yet but there's a song in gypsy because just like alfred hitchcock said to me it's all music and all these songs and these lyrics come back to me (laughs) and come back to me oh my god Uh, that was in uh, on a clear day you can see forever that's a piece of material from on a clear day and on a clear day didn't we have eve montant in that picture yeah yeah and so now I'm coming to visit my wife at the time, Barbara, who's making making uh, making your movie, and uh, to have lunch. And uh, Vincent Minnelli, who had uh, I'd met when he was uh, he came to see me and with Liza when we did the Fantastics together on stage, and he what came up to me and he said, "There's a new uh, actor here. It's not a very big part." Uh, but he plays a friend of Barbara's and he doesn't know how he wants to look and I want to introduce you. Uh, so he talk, took, took me and introduced me to uh, Jack Nicholson. 
And then So What, which I'm thinking about possibly a title for a book that uh, people seem to want uh, to be written uh, about my work and my life. I didn't realize that it was a great composition by Miles Davis. So what? You, you check it out. It's great. I will. So now we did make two movies together right away. We did Getting Straight with wow. D Dick Rush. Yeah. But we did a movie, a not a very good movie called Move. No, but... stop it, please. Every movie, I don't care what it is, it's, a, it's about working. So yeah, yeah, not a very good movie. Not a very good movie being produced by Pandro S. fucking Berman. Well, that, that's, you know, you beat me to it because Pandro Berman was head of RKO production when they made Gunga Din and, and Citizen Kane. He produced National F. Velvet, Father of the Bride, Blackboard Jungle, Jailhouse Rock with Presley, and A Patch of Blue, amongst others. Did you, get to, did you get to talk to Pandro and, and corner him and get to find Boy, some? I, I went to sleep with him. Come on, are you kidding? I told you the camera saved my life. And, and then not only that, but Bill Daniels was the cameraman. Yes. Bill fucking Daniels. And I know another Bill Daniels who I love, who was the president of my union and a great actor. This is right. Bill Daniels, who I was told was Greta Garbo's favorite cinematographer. Greta Garbo would not work. work. And he says to me, because, I mean, Stuart Rosenberg wasn't the right director for that. He may have been the right person for it, but he wasn't the right director for it. And I would had no experience. And then when they brought Pat McCormick in to write jokes for me, I'm no fucking comedian i'm just i'm learning to be one, one of us a human being someone you can identify with someone you can open it up you know and say oh is this what i am you know so bill daniels oh and genevieve wait and dick benjamin's wife paula she's great and davy burns who's an amazing masterpiece of a of a performer has a small part in it i and joe silver is my brother in it and 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 joe lieber who wrote it and the picture didn't work it's a, a and there are people who really are discovering it you got to look deeper into it i mean no i wouldn't want to remake that there's one picture that i've done that didn't work that can be remade do you it's want to tell whiffs. me what that one is? Yes, it's called Whiffs. Uh, and uh, it's uh, I was a, a, a soldier, a professional soldier in the chemical corps. We tried everything out on me and everybody else. It's hysterically funny. I'll have to watch it. So then you get to work with Altman on, on MASH. And I have a question. I know he did so much improvisation. Whose idea was it? To have the olives in your him him, in your him 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 I don't drink. I mean, I remember that was around the time I was going to see uh, taking Barbara to the Academy Awards. But, but wait a minute. So for some of you who may not remember, there's this great moment where your your character is putting together a martini, and you pull out of your pocket a bottle of olives, and you stick them wonderfully an oh, olive I stick in, in my drink. drop it that was a little a pressure you know you make movies i mean it, it went in i had to go i had to go swish did you see the game last night yes <laughs> so let me so was that in the script where did that i believe so that was not an improvisation altman knew that then then we'll see again i mean uh he did talk with me about the long goodbye and, and Altman saying to me, what do you think? Because, I mean, I, by that time, I had uh, let myself be known and I couldn't find a fucking job. And I had really, you know, I mean, and even your... Uh, I, I shouldn't have to be too careful here. I mean, uh, uh, Robert Altman, wow, he gave... So I, I, I while, when we were doing... Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. I auditioned for a play by Murray Shiskow called The Way of Life. And uh, they gave it to me. I got it. Uh, and so we made the movie and I discovered my relationship with the camera. And then I went to New York and uh, my director in it was Alan Schneider, who had directed the first production that we knew of. He directed uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? 
and who told me that he was like the godson of Samuel Beckett uh, from uh, 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 Waiting for Godot and uh, other amazing uh, avant-garde masterpieces, abstraction, abstract. And so uh, they fired Alan Schneider and then they fired me. And, uh, but I, I wasn't destroyed because I had found my relationship with the camera. Uh, and so I came out to Los Angeles and I was asked to meet Robert Altman from MASH. And uh, this is pre getting straight. This right. is pre move. Those were the sequences of stuff, right? Uh, uh, believe me, move didn't work. It's a great, it, it's great. We could look at it in terms of the life in it. And if you remember everybody, I'm, everybody's walking backwards and I'm walking forwards. And on that Saturday in September, when the, uh, the Mets are playing the Baltimore Orioles in the World Series. That may have been uh, what nineteen uh, uh, sixty-nine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Alban gives me the script to mash. I read it. Uh, he asks me to come back, and he says to me, uh, "How would you feel about playing the American Southerner, Duke, uh, Tom Skerritt's part?" I said, "I never question an offer. All I want to do is work." I said, "But." I could do it, I said. I have a musical ear and I could work at having an acceptable Southern accent. I remember when Charles Lawton did it in Advise and Consent and that prick, he's my favorite actor, Charles fucking Lawton. You know, how many people don't even know who, who he was? And he was married to the bride of Frankenstein. Elsa Lancaster was his wife in real life. And he, he's dying from cancer and making advice and consent with a, with a Southern accent. Unbelievable. And this is what you love. This is why, this is why you're here, Howard, and I'm uh, uh, a hawk. And so, uh, so I said, I, I could do it. But if you haven't cast Trapper John McIntyre, I've got the juice for it. I got what you what you what you want, and he, like he let me cast myself, and so that was that. That's a great story. I had never improvised, and that's why he said have have lunch with Donald. Donald was set before me, and so at the commissary, in at Fox, uh, Altman had me and Donald sit down and have lunch together. And the first contact, I said this. I felt this guy doesn't like me. Sutherland doesn't like me, you know, like me, I'm like a fucking Jew, you know, that then they, and, and some of us don't have never met any of us, right? I mean, we've been moving too fast. And so, uh, but we work together and how Altman did it. Everybody's with Altman. We're working for Altman, but it's just me and Donald. And, uh, but I'd never improvised. And then there was one scene and Donald and I were working on it. It's where we're hitting golf. Uh, balls and they're they're coming to show us the x-rays so we can come to uh tokyo to operate on a baby and uh we weren't comfortable and i, I wasn't uh too happy about it and so we talked to dick shepherd great friend uh our agent and complained about robert altman not to have him fired or anything like that but still not not knowing how your business works and uh, Altman thought we wanted him fired. So he reshot, which showed me that he was willing. I mean, what, what uh, I said that between Donald and me, I mean, we got no future. I mean, you know, there has to be people for us to work with. And uh, so that was that. And wow. Altman even said to me, uh, this, and this is, I mean, again, I, I shouldn't, I'm not to be embarrassed because I'm, I'm putting it all out here for all of us who are here. I mean, it means a lot to me that there's a home for us. And so, I mean, it's just uh, uh, unbelievable. Um, so you get nominated for Bob and Carol. MASH is a smash. And you're invited... And you're invited to uh, to work with Ingmar Bergman, and at the same time, you're on the cover of Time Magazine. Tell me about your ego at this point, and how I have one. 
I, I, don't, I don't have one. It's just, then it's not a matter of ego. It's a matter of who you're working with. I'm about to direct a picture. Uh, I, I have no, uh, uh, I haven't done it yet. And Ingmar said to me, when you direct, he said, and you will direct, he said, you mustn't act. And no matter who's doing it or who's done it, you'll understand. I, I can't. I could only do it with a, uh, a a team, an economical team of like-minded people. Because once it comes to administrating the time and spending money, uh, I mean, then we are responsible, and 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 we're we're hoping to build to make a future for workers where all okay, of us so, revolve. Go ahead. Okay. So so Elliot, so you're on the cover of Time. You've got a big hit movie. You've been nominated for an Oscar. Tell me about what's going on inside of you. And I know, of course, it's about the work, but there's got to be, I'm sure there are people, as we know, yes, what we'll call yes men, who are patting you on the back. What's what's in your head right now with all this going on? Did you know what, it, again, uh, who, uh, who knows what it's like to be you, Hawk? Uh, only me only you not even uh, molly huh no Mo Mo molly doesn't know what it she has to put up with me but... you know but but uh, so i uh, again this is uh this is where i'm deciding about letting a, uh, writing a book but my uh, uh intention has to be positive because uh, I love the family so much and I'm so totally devoted and committed to us that I have to be sure uh, because I, I, I was, I know that I, I went too far. And even in 1970, prior to exhibiting that in the next picture, because I had already produced a picture, produced Little Murders, time, everything came out just the way we intended it to. Uh, uh, and I acted in it and I, 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 everything was right. And then, so um, Ingmar said to me, and I quote, you've gone beyond your limits and you'll have to live more to understand what you've done. And so, uh, this is something I'm very fortunate and blessed that I was able to get back. I have a, no, no, no yes, man. But then there are people, do we understand one another? You just now has told me something that's enormous, that Molly doesn't know how it, what it is to be you. I can't imagine to being married to someone who doesn't know what it's like to be me. I think she knows more about me and what I will do than, uh, than anybody I've ever met in my life. But she isn't inside me, Elliot, and I don't think there's anybody inside you uh, that, that knows you, no matter whether it's your Molly <laughs> or your Jenny or Barbara or anybody else, really knows what it's like to be or inside Jason, you. Or Sam, or Henry, or Daisy, or Emmanuel. Uh, right. But I do believe, and this is the hope for our humankind. Uh, this is the hope for humankind. As a matter of fact, I've got something I could uh, share with you. How much more time do we have? Because I, I uh, we, we, have, we have a little over a half hour. Oh, that's great. Uh, I'll read something to you. It's, uh, it's just that this is the extent of it that I just okay. uh, stumbled on, that I saved. Uh, it says, I'm not an optimist uh, because I'm not sure that everything ends well, and nor am I a pessimist because I'm not sure that everything ends badly. I just carry hope in my heart. Whew. Hope is a feeling that life and work have a meaning. You either have it or you don't, regardless of the state of the world that surrounds us. Life without hope is an empty, boring, and useless life. I cannot imagine that I could strive for something if I didn't carry hope in me. I'm thankful to God for this gift. It's as big a gift as life itself. 
That, that can answer any question that you may have. Who wrote that? Uh, very good question. Uh, uh, Vaclav Havel. He was the uh, guy from the Czech. Well, yeah, no, I know who he was, sure. Sure. Therefore, what comes to mind is this guy, Zelensky, the guy, the Ukrainian guy right now. I mean, uh, we, we must make, uh, we must, if you want, we'll call it peace. We have to make peace. All of us are going to get wiped out. Right. So how did you, uh, would you talk to me about when, when you had gone through some, some difficult times, you said, and then you got the long goodbye. How did you get the long goodbye? Tell me about how that came well, about. Well, my difficult times, I, I, I'll share, because, I mean, education is so important. Uh, but the long goodbye now, again, you told me, I mean, I have uh, uh, Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice, Academy Award nomination, MASH, Through the Roof, uh, and then Getting Straight, and Ingmar Bergman choosing me uh, beyond any, everybody, anybody else you could think uh, to play his part, uh, and then coming back, and continuing to work. Um, now ask me the question again. You had gone through a difficult time after all of that, and then you got the long goodbye. Tell me uh, how, uh, 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 so how that happened. Well, there was no work for me. Um, Why was there no work for you? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Let, let me this. Uh, uh, let, let me let me finish. Why okay. was there no work for me? Um, so I didn't have work, and I I, I told you everything is uh, uh, is. A canon will be common knowledge. Nothing new. This is not a new story. Um, and I didn't have any work, and I seemed to be unemployable. And David Picker, who was running United Artists, was a, a, like a friend of mine. I never socialized with him. And he, You're a friend of mine as well. Yeah, I brought. Yeah, I, he was great. Very, very supportive to artists. Yes. Herb Gardner was another friend of his. He wrote A Thousand Clowns. And um, so I went to see David, because there I was producing. It, it appeared that I had a quite a fertile um, um, promise, potential to produce. Uh, you know, producing it interests me, being that I know chemistry. I know what can work together. And uh, so he gave me the script of The Long Goodbye. And at that time, uh, uh, we thought that Peter Bogdanovich was going to direct it. And Peter couldn't see me in the role, just could, didn't see it. And, uh, and David told me he was talking about Lee Marvin and talking about Robert Mitchum. And I said, I can't argue with them. They're like my uncles. I mean, I love them, I, you know, but we've seen them. You haven't seen me. He gave it to Robert Altman. Our, our Altman was in, you're going to make me cry again, was in Ireland finishing uh, images with Susanna York, uh, with whom, who worked with me a couple of times. And uh, Altman called me uh, in the West Village where I lived at 58 Morton Street, he, he said to me, what do you think? He called me from Ireland. I said, I always wanted to play this guy. And he said, you are this guy. And that was the beginning of the picture. Wow. Wow. Very cool. So I've got to jump because we don't have that much time. No, 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 because I'm grounded now. I mean, and that, I mean, you know, I always, uh, always come back and I'm right. Like, have you ever seen me as a turtle? You want to show me right now? Or is no, I just use your mind. I mean, uh, I, don't, I don't want anybody painting names on my back. Right. So, uh, Bob, did you want to say something? 
Yeah, I've got to jump off and I'm going to watch the last half hour of recorded, but I wanted to thank Elliot for joining us. Uh, Elliot, I don't know whether you remember, but I used to bump into you and Norman Lloyd and your little crowd at Votrasante on San Vicente, lunches on the weekend. Such a nice group. Yeah, I don't deny anything. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't remember you, but uh, ha, uh, Hawk speaks highly of you, and I know you're in a position uh, that can help uh, a lot of us. Good. All right. Well, thanks again for being here. Oh, you're very welcome, and thanks for having me. You bet. So I want to jump to uh, Saturday Night Live. And okay. the reason the reason is because you that was my favorite program. I couldn't wait till Saturday night. It was well way before TiVo or DVR, and I actually stayed up. That was when I could actually stay up from eleven thirty to one in the morning, which. I can't remember the last time I did that. But you got to work with the first cast, with Gilda and Belushi and Aykroyd and Curtin and Lorraine. And... Uh, Garrett Morris, don't forget Garrett, Garrett Morris. Our top story tonight... <laughs> oh, Michael um, O'Donoghue, he was the finest. Michael O'Donoghue. Michael O'Donoghue, so, yeah. I mean, one of my favorites, and I just watched it again, sketches was the interior demolitionists oh of course <laughs> i think that was my oh my god favorite. oh that was uh, great with chevy chevy and i are breaking down walls great oh, it was, it, for those of you go to youtube and watch the uh, uh the uh the uh, interior demolitionists it's hysterical i want to ask you it is there a favorite sketch that you did and all you did six shows you were host six and times I did the seventh i did i mean i, I was one of the first five timers right uh, but know, is there a sketch is there a sketch that you did that you everyone oh my god i i, I want to watch this again uh no i still the castration walk was unbelievable because on the first show and i i, I didn't really stay up so late to watch it but then uh jenny and gary weiss convinced me uh, 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 to do the show. And so I did. And the first show uh, I opened up uh, with uh, Let Yourself Go by Irving Berlin and Crazy Rhythm. And I danced, old fashioned song and dance from like the beginning of the interview. And on stage with me was Paul Schaefer. And it wasn't scripted that I would, uh, he'd be introduced. And I said it, and that was, I think, about the time when the Americans were beating uh, the Finns and the Russians. And I said, you know, I said something about the Russians, you know, <laughs> fuck the Russians and uh, uh, let's kick their ass. But we can't fucking drop atomic bombs. They're going to drop it on us and then, then that's going to justify it. And uh, I said, I introduced Paul Schaefer. Uh, on the show, and he said he'll never forget. He'll always remember that because I introduced him and said his name. As you listen to the band, don't you get a bubble, Irving, Irving. And of course, in that, I'm the psychiatrist for the unbelievably beautiful, talk about sensitive and great, John Bellucci as Vito Corleone. Oh my the, God, uh, and when he puts, the, when he puts the, the orange peel in his mouth, I thought it was Brando. He, he was so was good. Brando, oh, he was great. And that, uh, sometimes I felt that Lauren would have me on the show because I could chill him out because like I said, I'm honest. And he was so disillusioned. Uh, and, and so then the second show, and that show they used as their representative show, and I won an Emmy. And Gilda, Gilda, the sweetie pie, brilliant girl, when we had her marry me at the end of the show. I mean, she like they've had as a running thing, she had a crush on me. We had done the show, oh, Elliot. She was great. She was just uh -huh. amazing. And then the second show, uh, I opened up with uh, Times Have Changed, and we've often rewound the clock since the Puritans got a shock when they landed on Plymouth Rock, and then went into uh, the song, Anything Goes, and I said, and tonight, 
everything goes. Now I'm all, I'm doing my old song and dance stuff and I'm having a good time and people are enjoying it. Uh, and now comes the third show and I'm, I'm ready to do the verse to all the things you are. Don't fence me in, which I've never sung, but it's so great. And you gotta have heart. Though your love is yeah, yeah. at zero, ha, ha, ha. take your chin up off the floor, ha, ha, ha. Mr. You can, so I'm ready to do my- Keep bit. going, you, Mr. You can be a hero. Yeah. You can open you can any open door, come door. On. There's nothing to it, but to do it, you gotta have, listen, heart. So uh, that's what I'm doing. I've, I've never sung those songs, I can't wait. And they said, and Lauren and uh, 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 Shore, the guy, the, the music guy, says, we, we wrote something so funny for you. It's the castration walk. And I said, under no circumstances. They said, please, just listen to it. I said, no. They said, please, it's so good. So we did the castration walk. Me, Bill Murray, and John Bellucci. It's really something. It's the case. Uh, I've never seen that. I got to find that. Uh, you can find it. All you got to do is try. You know, all you got to do is try. <laughs> I've got to try. Now, I gotta the last thing it. about Saturday Night Live uh, that I'll share now is now I come in. It's on a Saturday. Oh, my God. What's going on? And uh, I, I don't know. And Peter Tosh, uh, who is the musical guest. And I don't know that my friend Mick Jagger is, uh, is singing back up for Peter Tosh, and he's come in to rehearse. Fucking Mick Jagger is rehearsing at NBC to do, to back up Peter Tosh, who is unbelievable, who, whose father shot him, I think. Like, uh, uh, you know, and so now, uh, oh my God, yeah, very exciting, very, very exciting. Oh, and, and then for you, you know the sketch, the Star Trek sketch. Oh, of course. Because with uh, that Gene Roddenberry wrote me a letter and I'm so glad that my friends had it published because I, I wouldn't share it in terms of, like I said, being embarrassed and not wanting to be misunderstood and misinterpreted like I could be now. When I got in my trouble, I mean, they said I was crazy. I mean, crazy to go against the grain, crazy to go too far when it comes to industry. I don't work here then. I mean, I work in my family. We don't have, you know what, you, you know what I'm talking about. We're, I'm second generation American. That which has evolved. So pretty great. We still got a little bit of time, huh? Well, we do. I want to move to. Uh, I want to move. You talked about the uh, the Muppets. Uh, my kids were little. Well, they were Muppet age when you were doing the Muppet movies, and they were so excited. And I just love to, to Lou Grade. Lou Grade uh, produced the Muppet movie and he had produced me in Capricorn One. And I did another picture for him. And I said, you got to put me in the Muppets. My kids love the Muppets. And so well, they wrote, they put me in on the mayor of the town and I introduced Miss Piggy. So now tell me about, tell me about working with Frank Oz and Jim Henson. That must have been a just riot. lovely, like working with friends. Working so, with friends. so, and then, so later on in your career, you move to Soderbergh and you do Contagion, which I think, I want to know, I know Soderbergh's a friend of yours. You do Contagion and now we have this pandemic going on. Do you and Soderbergh talk about that and when everything hit oh, the what fan we're talking three about years now ago? is about the Boston Celtics and the... Uh, uh, the Golden State Warriors. That's what we're talking about. I said to him, <laughs> I think that the, the, the Celtics can beat Golden State, but I'm rooting for Golden State up until last. Okay, time. so so I'll ask so I'll ask you another question. I'll ask a different question. This I know this sounds like a uh, like a questionnaire, and you you get on a, in an essay in college. What are you compare talking about? Compare and contrast. Compare and contrast. Paul Mazursky, Robert Altman, Steven Soderbergh, and their way of working. Well, uh, but when I was growing up uh, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, we had the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, they also had the New York Giants, and there was the New York Yankees, three different teams in the same city. Uh, oh, my God, the, the, those guys. 
They're my friends also. I can do that. That was from Chorus Line. That was from Chorus Line. You could see uh, Michael Bennett, who made Chorus Line. I hear Hawk and actually Walsh. You didn't get to Walshy, who wrote California Split, with whom I lived it with him. Talk about Robert Altman. So said to me and I, that he just saw a documentary on American classics about Joe Papp, that it's an amazing piece of work about Joseph mm. Papp, who brought us free theater, theater in right. New York. Right. And then when I bumped into him outside of the palace, that place that I, I could say that we played when I was 12, I mean, he was there and I was standing in the street in the gutter. And he said, he saw me, he said, what are you doing here? And I thought, is it okay with you that I'm here? You know, I mean, so, and Soderbergh said to me when we were shooting a scene in the ocean, in Ocean's Eleven, and we're all lined up, we're lit and we're ready to go. And I've got a scene with Matt Damon and I've got, I've got I have no problem with Marx being a, a, a dancer. I, I hit my Marx all the time. And then Warren Beatty suddenly knocking on my door saying, Look, bring me up, bring me up. And, but don't tell, don't tell anybody it's me. And so Soderbergh says to me, like we're ready, ready to shoot. And this is where Clooney is gonna tell everybody why we're there in terms of the big hit. And uh, Stephen walks to me and says, the ink on the face was at an improv. And I think, what are you, do you want me to wake up? What are you talking to me? I've, I've got my words that I have to say in my scene with, I, you want me to, I said, oh, okay, the long, and we say at the same time, the long goodbye. I said, uh, yes, it was an improv. I said, was that behavior acceptable to you? And uh, he said, yes, but it was so surprising. I said, but what that exhibited, the ink on the face, uh, was because once I commit, and it wasn't in the script, to putting the fingerprints under the uh, ink on my face, if I stop uh, and then rub it in and do Al Jolson, uh, it's going to cost us 25 minutes or more uh, to uh, it was clean me up and movies is about time management in relation to resources. I said that exhibited the kind of confidence and trust that Altman had in me to do that, you know. So, oh my God, three great directors. And uh, I can't compare anybody, really great to be. I, I did, did, uh... I don't remember Paul letting you uh, uh, improv. Yeah, well, I now you know, I'll give it to you because I'm so fucking pissed off with Paul. I mean, I remember when I got had my problem with A Glimpse of Tiger, which then became What's Up Doc, which is not what I had in mind. And I didn't do it. And I couldn't let myself be fucking threatened or intimidated that what I, you're going to take my career away from me. I'm being, you mean you can't follow me? You mean the business people can't follow me? Very naive of me. And in a way, not too smart, uh, because it's not about talent. I, I know this now, I could teach a, a master's class in stardom. Uh, and then who was it? Sly and the Family Stones. Uh, uh, everybody is a star. As Paul wrote when we did Bob and Carol. Uh, uh, and then we were so successful. And then he was writing Bloom in Love for me. And uh, that was a tough uh, subject uh, for me, uh, and the divorce. And, uh, and then he also, they were pleading with me, Frankovich and him to do, uh, oh, come on now. Uh, Next stop, Greenwich Village. No, 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 no guessing, none, none of that. To do uh, the second picture, the second picture, Bloom, no, what's the second picture? You may have worked on it. I'll, I'll give it to you, but then Donald did it. Donald wound up doing it and worked with Fellini. I would have got a chance to work with Fellini, but Fellini told uh, Monica Vitti when he saw what I did with her uh, that I seemed to be a nice guy. Wow. Uh, so it, tell, is there a director that you still want to work with that you wish maybe you'll get a chance to work with? Oh, well, I mean, you, you know, I have a, my own view of, uh, of life and death. It's all about being here now. Uh, Billy Wilder, 
Billy Wilder said to me at, at the end, because he needed to be insured, he said, if there's something you're interested in doing, Again, you're going to make me cry. He said, let me read it because uh, uh, give, me a ch give me a chance. Can you imagine oh Billy God. Wilder saying to any oh. one of us, give me a chance because I'd really like oh. to work with you. Oh. Is there a director? No, I want to find the director. If, if, I, if, if, if I'm able to get this picture uh, that I'm interested in, and believe me, I can't sell anybody anything. You can buy, you know, whatever. This is not for sale. Uh, that... Uh, uh, it's just uh, pr pretty, pretty astonishing. This world, this business, this life, and our work is just great. And I really appreciate, uh, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity because I'm, I'm. It's wild, as you can see, but it's yeah. very important to me knowing that it's you, and you know me. Uh, when uh, when we came out to do on a clear day, the first place that anybody took us to was, I think, your house. Yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned that you knew quite a bit about the business and what it's like to be a celebrity. What, what advice would you give a young actor today that's in 2022 that and that might be on his way up or on her way up or on their way up. <laughs> oh, well, it's always to like to listen, just um, just listen and and continue to learn uh, and study because uh, in, in relation to the package of what we are as human beings, I had bumped into Stanley Kubrick when he was turning a corner uh, on 7th Avenue in New York, right outside of a Horn and Harditz, which I used to like to go to. And I thought that he would be like six feet 10 or something, but I had studied uh, the killing. I'd studied some of his work and I, we stopped and talked. And then I got to work with his assistants, first assistants. And, uh, and, the, and, and I said to Derek Cracknell, uh, uh, who had done 2001, and uh, I said, I, I understand the picture. I, I, I think I understand almost everything. But at the end, what does the, the, the little baby, the little infant in the bubble, what does that represent? And, and, and Derek said to me, it's the little feller coming back to disarm the planet. So no... Sometimes some of them, I'd like to direct, I'd like to work with some directors who haven't been born yet. And my friend, my late great friend, Norman Lloyd, who was a hundred and six and a half, that would give me a, a, over 20 years, the age of my grandson, Henry, who's 22 and, and about to be 23. Uh, so who... Somebody asked me, actually, an Israeli asked me if I knew, you can help me with this, because all I want to do is work together. Uh, a, a, a young woman uh, who directs comedy. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I would wish uh, uh, this Israeli uh, uh, on, uh, on, on her, not knowing who she is, but there are people who want to work. And I had a dream, I had not, not a dream, a, an image and a wish for a new American studio which of course has to improve itself, but that so much of it has to be educational, has to be education. So when something happens, like what's happening on earth as we speak, that we, we can be prepared to understand that, oh, then there are words, continue to educate, continue to educate. I couldn't stand this trial of Johnny Depp and that, uh, and that beautiful uh, ex-wife of his. I really couldn't stand it. And I don't want to be in politics, and I, I, I know, but I know it. I, I mean, I, I know, I understand it. Directors, oh, they're, we're all here. We're all here. I don't have to be in anything. I'd be so happy to be a best boy or load. Uh, no more magazines, right? It's not film. It's not film anymore. Well, when, when, you, when you started doing some television and you, you started doing the recurring, recurring role on Friends, what was it like to do 
a sitcom as opposed to how did you did you have to change process to do to do a oh, sitcom? Oh no, I have to pay attention. I remember uh, they called me. I remember exactly where I was. Uh, I remember where I was, and uh, when they said, you know, they they'd done a pilot. And, and, and NBC is programming it uh, in between, I think, I think Seinfeld and the Paul Reiser show uh, with, uh, uh, and, uh, and so I read it and there wasn't much uh, in it for me, uh, but then I saw that Jim Burroughs was directing it. And as I told you earlier, I'd worked for Abe, the guy who directed Guys and Dolls. I mean, and also, and, and the guy who directed, who, he sent me an opening night telegram, and I can get a few wholesale. I still have it. Abe fucking Burroughs. Uh, so that was great to meet them and to do it. That was great. And then Ray Donovan. And, and just about, oh, there's a show that I recommend called Out to Lunch. And you asked me about the Muppets. And this was a primetime network show. Uh, uh, that uh, called Out to Lunch uh, with the Muppets. Uh, and, uh, uh, oh my goodness, and Carol Burnett and Barbara Eden and the Electric Company. The Electric Company and for the, children, Freeman. the Children's Television Workshop. And when we were doing it, Rita Marino, who was in the group of the Electric Company, the, great, the brilliant Rita Marino, was doing a, a, a stage play called uh, The Roxy. And she, and she was known because she did a very funny thing uh, uh, in, in her Puerto Rican accent of everything's coming up roses. And I said, I, I'll ask Julie Stein uh, uh, if you can use it. And he said, yes. And then when I was doing a picture, uh, uh, not a very good picture, but still, the, it was about the relevance of American revolutionary values in a multinational corporate world. That's a pretty good thing. And, and you know, and uh, uh, I wanted to be where I'm hiding at. I'm an uncorrupted teacher of American history at Harvard. And we did a lot of the shooting at McGill in, uh, in, uh, in Montreal, in, in, in Quebec, but I did get to go to Harvard. And so I asked Julie again, can I be while I'm hiding out in the in the girl's place, can I say, uh, uh, start to sing people, people who need people are the horniest people in the world. I didn't get a laugh. And of course, luck, happily, he said no. <laughs> but that would be funny. What's wrong? <laughs> Thanks, Howie. Elliot, this has been a blast. I well, hope well, I want to add fun. one more thing. One more thing I want to sure. add, which is my dear, dear, dear friend, Groucho Marx, who gave me the greatest review I will ever get. Number one, uh, I changed a light bulb over his bed. And, uh, and, and as I took the used one out and put the new one in, Groucho said to me, that's the best acting I've ever seen you do. And, and not to forget that Groucho is quoted as having said that outside of a dog, a book is a man's best friend, and inside of a dog, it's too dark to read. Well, what we're going to do now, Elliot, as I said, we're not having you. lunch, oh, a hawk. I mean, I'm not oh, yeah. even getting a lunch. I, I'm interested. We had a, a great lunch over at Factors, specials and BS. Yes. Yeah. Yes, but what we're going to do now for all the people watching, because they've seen a bunch of these stories, uh, uh, we're going to show about a four and a half minute clip of some of your iconic moments throughout your career that uh, we think is just terrific. But Jennifer, our director, wants to come on before we do that and ask a question that she gets to ask everybody that I interview. So, Jen, here you are. Hello. Thank you so much for being on with us today. All of the residents here have been participating in this live interactive show since the beginning of the pandemic. It's a way for everyone to stay creative. So, we've been asking all of the guests, what is your favorite film and what is your favorite television series? Uh, I don't have favorites, but I could give you one of each. Great. And by fear, 
so therefore easily the quiet man john ford's the quiet man mm -hmm. and uh i love lucy perfect um so go ahead I also, jan i just want to thank hawk as well it's been an incredible 90 minutes i'm gonna go away and uh hawk take us home well yeah i just wanted to just Thank you so much. Your life and still going is amazing, Elliot. So we're going to take a look at a clip package of many of your roles. Uh, and for those of you who may miss it right now, uh, don't forget it'll be on uh, MPTF YouTube channel in a few hours. You can watch the whole thing again, but certainly I want you to watch this, uh, this movie package. Elliot, thank you. You can watch, Elliot, because you might see... I want to watch. I want to watch it. I'll call you because I can call my friends since I'm ahead of time sometimes as uh, my friends uh, 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 you know, throughout the country to take a look at it uh, if, that, if that's possible, if, uh, if they could tune in. But I don't want you to go to any trouble. No, no. This will be on YouTube in a couple of hours. So let's roll. Let's roll the clip. And Elliot, again, thank you. Thanks, You're amazing. Elliot.